upon. Let's go ahead and grab our Bibles this morning. I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of John, chapter number 8. The book of John, chapter number 8. Going to read just a few verses from this chapter. We have just come off of what is celebrated in this country as Independence Day. Amen. And uh, we are thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy here in this country. But the word freedom is um, loosely thrown around and poorly understood in most cases. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, we would, uh, you don't hear this much anymore, maybe so much, or maybe because I'm not a kid, I don't hang around the kids, maybe they still do. But you'd, you'd have some obnoxious child that was in your neighborhood that was about your age doing something very obnoxious. And... Uh, you know, whatever he was doing. And, and inevitably, it would lead to some kind of an argument that ended with, it's a free country, <laughs> right? We didn't even know what that meant. We just thought it meant, leave me alone so I can do what I want. Uh, somehow being a free country had something to do with pelting each other with dirt balls and rocks. I don't know what it was. But, you know, there was always that, at least that one obnoxious kid in the neighborhood, right? And if there wasn't one, you were probably that one that was the obnoxious kid in the neighborhood. Uh, so we, we throw freedom around a lot, and so since we're coming off of uh, Independence Day and everybody's kind of got liberty and freedom perhaps on the mind, uh, you know, not surprisingly, maybe the Bible has quite a lot to say about freedom, has quite a lot to say about liberty. We're going to talk about that this morning. Our text is going to be from John chapter number 8. We'll begin reading in verse number 30. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever but the Son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful to you this morning for your word. Above all things, we're thankful for the hope you've given us in Jesus Christ and for the gift that he gave us, the death on the cross, the blood of his sacrifice, the power of his resurrection that gives us hope as well. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather this morning. Pray that you might be with the preaching. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to lift your name in song and in praise. And uh, Lord, just pray that as you've worked in our hearts to bring us to this time in the service, that you might guide us on as well by your spirit and the preaching of your word, that you'd be with my heart, that you'd be with my mouth, that you'd help me to speak the things that are true, the things that are right. And Father, that you might be with the hearts of the people as well, that they might be receptive to what you have for us this morning, Lord, that we would be humble in our spirits, that we would be open in our hearts as students gathered to be taught by your hand. Father, we just pray that you might bless the service according to your will. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All right, you may be seated. When we talk about freedom and we talk about liberty, that's... Uh, a concept that's familiar to many people in our country and I think we see some important things in this text that Jesus Christ himself was using uh, this concept of freedom to teach and to instruct some things concerning man's lot in this life and the purpose of his coming to set them at liberty which we know as the angel pronounced uh, the birth of Jesus Christ one of the things that he was set to do was to set them at liberty Right, to declare and to proclaim liberty to the captives. So what Jesus Christ brought as the light of his teaching was bringing some things to these people's mind to help them understand the truth about freedom. And, and we think we see pretty clearly that what he's saying is there's, there's more to being free than thinking you're free. Amen. And I think we live in a time today when a lot of people think they're free. Right? And, and they get quite angry because they're free. Which actually shows the truth that they're in captivity. Right. They don't know what freedom is. And they're still in bondage and still in captivity. 
And those things manifest themselves. So the kind of liberty that Christ is interested in and that he's talking about is a liberty of the soul. A liberty of the soul. And you know, the worst kind of captivity I think there is is a person who thinks they're free. And if we look around society today, we certainly see a lot of people who are acting on what they think are their rights because they are free. And what we see is a lot of people who unwittingly are in captivity. In captivity. Jesus Christ taught that we, born into this world, he says it very clearly, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So how many of us have ever committed sin? All right, so we, we've come into the world and we are from birth, by nature, we are sinners. Right? From birth and by choice, we are sinners. That's our nature and there's, you cannot escape or wish away that truth. So when we talk about freedom, we see what Christ is talking about, that this uh, bondage that we have by our nature to sin is exactly what he came to set us free from. I think one of the reasons this is on my mind this morning, and, I, and I've kind of uh, you know, wondered how exactly to work through what I want to talk about this morning, and then I decided to divide it up maybe and do some this morning and some tonight, is because, uh, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, one of the things about um, young people, we have a lot of young people here, right? and I pray for these young people. They're in a very critical season of their life. And most young people uh, that are in those years between, you know, 16, 22, have no idea how the decisions they are making and will make in that season of life, how they will impact the dire direction and trajectory of their entire life. And they will continue to deal with, either for better or for worse, the choices and the decisions they make in this season of life. And one of the lies that the devil tells us uh, in that season of life is that coming of age means more freedom. And the freedom that that seems to uh, portray in the minds of young people is a casting off of authority and the, the liberty, what we seem to be liberty, to do what we want. And that is a false idea of freedom. Amen. Liberty is not, and even, even the Bill of Rights in modern contexts and conversations is pretty poorly misunderstood because liberty is not about the freedom to do what you want. It's about the opportunity and ability to do what's, what you ought and what's in your best interest. If you look at the Bill of Rights, it doesn't, it's not saying so much that you're guaranteed to be able to do these things as much as it's trying to limit the oppression of those who would not allow you to exercise those things. And that's a little, it's a subtle difference, but it's an important difference. I liken it to this as parents. When you, when you talk about your home, you know, the true understanding of freedom and liberty is to be free from oppression, right? That's, that's the true classical sense of freedom. It, it doesn't mean that you have rights to be, you know, rich and healthy and wealthy and all these things. No, it's the freedom from oppression, right? And that's kind of how this country's founding principles uh, were around that idea, to loose all of the oppressing forces uh, so that you could pursue life, liberty, and happiness, and all those things within the constraints of society. If we talk about freedom today, people think, well, I have rights, and I'm supposed to be able to do X, Y, and Z. But freedom doesn't work that way. We could use some simple examples this morning, and I was going to, uh, I thought about doing an object lesson, but I, I decided not to, because I would have to deliberately lie to somebody to, point, to, to make the point of, how the devil works to deceive us, which is exactly what Christ is saying, but I didn't actually want to lie to somebody. But you're not always, you're only as free as the opportunity and the ability allow. When you're raising children in the home, what is, what is one of your roles as a parent? It's to guarantee, if you will, the freedom of your children. Now, how do you do that? By allowing them to do what they want? No, because if you allow them to do what they want, they will bring themselves into bondage. How do you do that? You do that among the children by guaranteeing that the strong don't oppress the weak, right? You, you make sure that the strong in the family, the older children, don't make bond servants uh, out of all of the young children, right? Because that, oppress, that force of oppression of the older ones and the tendency to make the younger ones into their little slaves, which happens in homes, right? 
uh, and they pr convince all the little kids to do all their stuff for them. And, and so that freedom is to take away that force of oppression, right? To, to bring justice uh, to that home. And a parent's job is to make sure that that is happening, that there's inequality. And so that happens through uh, disciplinary means. It happens through education. Uh, you know, that you can educate your children about why you have strength and what the Lord expects you to do with that. And it's fascinating to look at God's word, which is where uh, we're going with our attention this morning, to see that in all these things, there's always an equality. Always an equality in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his body. It talks about to whom much is given shall much be required. An equality. Right? So if you have a lot that Christ has given you in wisdom and understanding and faith, uh, whatever area it is, that's not to puff up your mind and to make you glory. It means he's going to judge you because he gave you more. So there's always plenty to balance uh, the body of Christ and to keep things in equality. But I want you to notice some things about freedom that Christ is saying from his word this morning. And, and he's talking with these people, and some of them had believed. He, and if you go back to verse number uh, 25, they're trying to get him to clarify exactly who he is. Right? And to this day, a lot of people are trying to figure out uh, who Jesus Christ is. He said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. And notice what he says next. I have many things to say and to judge of you. Interesting. He's, he's speaking to this crowd of people. And he knows the hearts and thoughts and minds and the history of every one of them. And he's saying, I have many things to say and to judge of you. In other words, if he wanted to, he could have gone into each one of them uh, and he could have spoken all the things that he wanted to about any one of them. Right? That would have been fairly convincing. Uh, he said he could do that, but he said, he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. If we go through this whole chapter, the entire chapter really has to do with, with two things. One, the word of God. And he talks about how the truth, in verse number 32, you will know the truth. And we know from John 17, 17, what is the truth? Thy word is truth. You know, I think it's important to, to realize in all the world, there's not another place to go to know the truth. You won't find it in your own mind and in your own heart and in your own thinking. You won't even find it in the Constitution of the United States. You won't find it there. You won't find it in the Declaration of Independence. You'll only find the truth in God's Word, which is why we believe that for our lives, it is the ultimate authority for everything in our life and in our practice and in our exercise of faith. He says that this truth and the knowledge of it will make you free. And then he goes on to say that whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, but the Son abideth ever. This brings us to our understanding of what he's talking about, about the adoption of sons, and how Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, is the only one who's in a position to set us at liberty. To set us at liberty. And while that seems like a an easy thing to understand and it seems like a common thing to grasp it's still misunderstood and misapplied in so many ways in our world today Jesus Christ was not trying to set people at liberty from their political authorities he wasn't trying to set them at liberty uh, from any of those other forces that are in the world actually he taught that we are to listen to those authorities the freedom he's talking about is a freedom in the soul of man. I think about um, Herod the Great and a man like that, or even Caesar himself. They thought in their minds they had great liberty, right? To, to use and to wield their power and their influence and their riches for their own benefit, right? And then you have 
uh, all this liberty being exercised in the world. And the Bible even says that the Lord doesn't resist them. Right? So they're doing all this stuff thinking they have liberty. And then you have a guy like John the Baptist who's shut up in prison. Or you have Paul writing the book of Philippians from a jail cell. And over and over in that, in that epistle, he's talking about rejoicing and joy in the Lord. So who's really at liberty? The king sitting on his throne who's killing babies because he's so fearful of losing his hold on power? Or the, the believer who has faith in Christ and he's sitting in the jail cell singing and praising to his God? One is at liberty and one is not. You know, it's it uh, not too long ago I was listening to a sermon that I think the Walkers had shared with me. Uh, and, and the guy brought out a great point how that the deceitfulness of sin, you know, when you are in bondage to sin, the deceitfulness and delusion of sin working in you, you start acting like you're the jailer, but you're actually the prisoner. And you see that play out in life so many times how we are deluded by sin and we are deceived by it into thinking things uh, that are so damaging and I ask the question all the time from this pulpit have you ever believed something that was a lie that worked out in your, ben in your favor have you ever been told something that was not true uh, and so you acted on that information and it worked out just great I mean over and over again when we believe lies and we believe, believe things that are not true we get harmed from that and that's what Jesus Christ is saying, that I'm going to tell you the truth about the lie of sin and its power and its influence in your life. And Jesus Christ said he came to set us free from sin. He didn't come to save us in our sins and leave us there. He came to save us from them. And so he's, he's turning us from sin, turning us from iniquity. And the popular idea that I can serve Christ and just continue on in sin you will find that if the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you, He won't allow that to persist. The Holy Spirit will work in your life to chasten you and to discipline you and to work in your life to cast down every imagination and high thing that exalts itself against God. So the work of God's work in our life, the work of God's word and spirit in our life is what Christ is alluding to and the power that He has as the Son to make us free. Verse number 36. If we look through how many times in this passage, verse number 31, he talks about continuing in my word. Verse number 37, my word hath no place in you. Verse number 43, he cannot hear my word. Verse number 47, he that is of God heareth God's words. Over and over and over again in this passage, in this dialogue he's having, he's talking about the truth of God's word and the place it must have in our hearts in order for us to be free. Why? Because by nature, we are coming into this world as bondage to sin, which means our nature is already prone to believe the lies. Prone to believe the lies. Right? And there's, I mean, how long could we spend enumerating all the lies that are in the world? I mean, it's, it's kind of the same with the commandments. You've broken one, you've broken them all. And the lie of the devil is the same way. He told one lie, and from that lie come all lies. I mean, you could take that one lie, and every other lie that gets told has a relationship to that lie. And it's, it's actually pretty fascinating to do that kind of a mental exercise. And that's exactly what he's talking about, because he goes on down to talk about that exact thing. If you look at verse number 44, he compares his word over and over and over again in this passage to verse number 44 ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is what next two words no, no truth in him Amen. now i want you to hear the words of the lord jesus christ because it is different than how we think and how we view lies in general Jesus Christ said there is no truth in him. Now you will often hear that the most uh, dangerous form of a lie is one that's mostly truth. And even we think about what, the, what Satan did in the garden and we think, well, there was some truth to that. Jesus Christ says there's no truth. Isn't that interesting to see God's perspective of a lie that gets told versus our own where we see, well, that's mostly true. Jesus said there's no such thing as mostly true that there is truth and there's no truth 
that to mix anything else with the truth is to confuse it and it's no longer any truth so jesus says that of the devil and his works and his word there's no truth in him well that that makes it a little easier for us who are trying to navigate this life to know where to find the truth it just got a whole lot easier you know so many times in our life and in our practice uh, the, the choices and decisions we're faced with are answered by this book. Amen. If we would take the time to ask. Oh, yeah. If we would take the time to ask. That is, that is the whole thing about uh, authority and understanding what true liberty is. How liberty actually works and what freedom brings. Freedom from oppression. If we think about how many ways that sin has brought oppression into the lives of men you will be hard pressed to find one instance a one for instance where sin has benefited people there's not one it always has the same consequence it always brings grief and sorrow it always has uh, i mean it's a destroyer it's a killer uh, there's nothing about sin that is advantageous to mankind it's a deceiver it's a lie. And yet we, we struggle day in and day out. Why? Because we have this working in us. You know, I, I, Jim and I were talking a couple weeks ago about so many places in the Old Testament where the psalmist talks about how he was uh, encompassed by his enemies. And oftentimes it can feel that way for the child of God, that we have sin uh, working in our members, right? And that new creature that is created after true righteousness and holiness oftentimes it can feel like is so encompassed with the infirmity of sin that it really is like being surrounded by our enemies so how can we be free the sun Amen. must make you free when you study the idea of bondage in scripture there's a number of different uh, aspects to it one is the bondage to sin that is the yoke that christ breaks the moment you put your trust in him that you are the yoke of sin, the power of sin in your life, uh, and all those things are taken away. But some of those things that pertain to sin in these bodies, uh, Paul talks about the bondage of corruption. We're still waiting for deliverance from that bondage. That we're still in bondage to this old corrupt body. And we're waiting for that bondage to be broken. I believe it was uh, Martin Luther, and I'm, I'm not necessarily a big fan of quoting men, um, but I, I did see this quote the other day, and I think it's, uh, it's interesting the way he puts it. He says, what is this world without the scriptures but hell itself? Amen. And you think about what Christ is teaching about how, the power of his word in someone's life and faith in his word and how that freedom can actually be found in him. I mean, you're not free just because you think you are. Amen. Not free just because you think you are. I mean, if I were to ask Sean this morning uh, if he feels pretty free, and he says yes, and then I ask him to step out in the aisle and ask him, okay, jump up and touch the ceiling, I bet he can't do it. He might try. <laughs> might need a running start. I know Ace couldn't because he's probably wearing his chain mail, and it's like 40 pounds. <laughs> There's no way. But, you know, either way, that's probably not going to happen. Why is that? Because you're not just free because you think you are. There is a God in heaven. And, that, and that's what he, that we often fail to understand. And so the nature of our flesh is to see authority as a threat. Whereas the spirit gives us confidence that the authority that's in our lives is an ally. Right. It's for our protection. It's for safekeeping. It's for our welfare. And so those two ideas really compete with each other in our minds and in the world today about what freedom looks like. You think about uh, the lies that were told in the Garden of Eden from the very beginning. Adam and Eve, as we would judge, rightly by the Spirit, were, had, had perfect liberty. They were in perfect liberty. Nothing, I mean, everything was uh, pure to them and free to them except for that one fruit. Uh, they were going to live forever. They had perfect joy, perfect contentment. They could serve God and live unto him, uh, and, and there would be no end to the bliss. And the devil comes along and says, well, here's something that this would be even better. 
And so they partook of that, which brought them into captivity. They were no longer free. They're no longer at liberty. Now they are a slave to sin. Over and over in Scripture, we see the truth of these things as as Jesus Christ is explaining very clearly in this passage. In verse number 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not. Listen, it doesn't matter what you say. If you don't believe God's word, you are not of God. That's what Christ just said. He's making it really plain. You can call yourself free. You can, you can claim a lot of things for yourself, just like these people were doing, that were saying, hey, we're, we've never been in bondage, and, and we're fine, and we're, we've enjoyed all this freedom. And Jesus is speaking to them uh, concerning the soul, and he's, he says, unless the Son makes you free, you're not free. Right. If the Son doesn't make you free, you're not free. So he says here again, he that is of God heareth God's words. And what is it that makes you free? It's God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Notice what he goes on to explain in verse number 45, 49. He says, I do honor my Father, and ye do dishonor what? Me, Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh. And whoever dishonors the Son does what to the Father? Dishonors the Father. I say all of this to say most of this is familiar to you. But I want to reiterate to you this morning the certainty of God's word. Amen. That our faith, you say you've got to have faith. And I hear so many people today talking about faith. You must have faith. But faith must be substantive. There's a substance to it. And what is it? It's God's word. Amen. And over and over again, especially in this passage, we see Jesus himself pointing people back to God's word. Over and over again. So if I were to ask you, what is your faith in? It needs to be in God's word. Amen. That what he spoke is going to come to pass. That we, cannot, uh, we can't find another way around it. We can't wish it away. And then he goes on to talk about uh, those who um, keep his sayings in verse number 51. Will never taste of death. And this is what really got the Jews going. It really got them upset. Because they were saying, well... Look at all of the men that we hold in honor and look at all these men that were of God and where are they? And the men were judging with the natural eye and they were looking around and saying, since I don't see them, they're dead. And Jesus is saying, you're the dead ones. You're the dead ones. And that's why you don't see them. See, we don't understand God's perspective. We think we're the ones who are alive and that all these other men have died. Jesus is saying, those men have not gone anywhere. They live to this day. But if you don't receive my words, then you're going to perish in your sins. He was just talking about that earlier. You will perish in your sins. You will die in your sins. So the, the importance is for us to understand that we're not the judge of God's work. He's the judge of our work. And he's trying to point out to them the life you think you have now, it's not life. You don't know life until you know Christ. Amen. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we look at Abraham, we take a guy like Abraham because that's the example uh, that Christ in, in the conversation he was having with these Jews. Look at the example of Abraham. They look at Abraham and they say, well, Abraham died because he's no longer here on this earth. And Christ is saying his earthly tabernacle, his earthly uh, tent was removed and taken away. But do you, does anybody in this room, anybody in this room, know what it's like to walk through death's door? None of us know. I mean, we have no idea, actually, other than the little glimpses we get. I told somebody the other day, I feel like with Scripture sometimes we're just looking through the keyhole of the door. You know, what's on the other side? We don't know what, what happens uh, at that moment when that all goes on. 
um, and, and how the Lord deals with those departed souls and uh, the angels uh, we know carried Lazarus into Abraham's embrace. And we don't, we don't understand all those things, but God sees it much differently is all we can say than we see it. So while we're left to deal with the corpse and the body, because it's necessary for those of us who are still here under the sun to do those things, uh, God sees it much differently. And Jesus Christ in another place even said, let the dead bury their dead. Let the dead bury their dead. If a man keeps his saying, he shall never see death. That's a promise of God. He says in another place, they will never taste of death. So the Jews become convinced that he has a devil because uh, he was making himself greater than Abraham. <laughs> Which to us who believe, it's like, yes, he created Abraham. Uh, he had a relationship with Abraham, but he's certainly greater than Abraham. Jesus said, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father that honoreth me of whom ye say that he is your God. Notice how many times he's contrasting the, what they're saying. You say he's your God. You say Abraham's your father. You say that you're free. But none of those things make it so. Us just saying it doesn't make it so. Us running around in the streets with baseball bats saying we're free doesn't make us free. It actually shows and demonstrates that we're in captivity. That we are under the power and influence of the devil and that we're not going to do the will of God. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So the Lord calls them out uh, very clearly and tells them that they're not the seed of Abraham. They're not the uh, children of God. I mean, everything that they are putting their confidence in, he's just batting them down one right after the other and leaves them without excuse and completely without defense. He said, well, we're of God because we're this or we're of Abraham's seed, so we're fine. And, and over and over again, he tells them, no, you're not free. You're not the seed of Abraham. You're not the children of God. And, he, and I don't know how much clearer he could have made it. At the very end, Jesus Christ says, I could also say that I don't know him and be a liar like you, but I do know him and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, saw it and was glad. This is, this is the question of liberty in the soul. Because if you've believed the word of God, then you have been delivered from the things of this life that keep men blinded to the truth. And why, why is everybody in, the, in this country today, uh, you know, lighting the world on fire and fighting and striving and all of these things? It's because they're still in darkness. They're still in bondage. They're still in captivity. They haven't known and believed the truth. And why haven't they? Because they haven't known this book. They haven't believed the testimony of God. And what concerns me as much as any of that going on is that the conversation has now turned and all of the churches are supposed to get involved. And that churches are supposed to basically become agents of society uh, to wrestle with all the social problems of society. But our conversation is in heaven. Amen. Jesus didn't, Jesus never commissioned his church or his apostles to be agents of society and to go out into the world and to reform it. The gospel is sent to be preached to men to deliver them from it. Deliver them from it. True freedom. True liberty. The exercise of ourselves unto God in, in ways that uh, really are beyond our ability to imagine or explain in the life that he's promised and in the world to come. I wanted to take this, uh, because most of this was my introduction, because I haven't really gotten anywhere yet. It's just kind of setting the table for where I want to go, but I realized it was, it was biting off a little too much uh, to do all this uh, in one fell swoop. So tonight we'll, we'll take a little more particular look at a for instance, a great for instance that's in scripture 
that actually shows us all the players in this exact conversation and how it works out in real time, right? That's the, the phrase we like to use today. How do these things apply to us in real time? We may take a look at that tonight, but suffice it to say, the opportunity, the opportunity to know freedom has been given to men through the preaching of the gospel. The ability to be able to be free is exercised through faith. So the opportunity is extended to men through the preaching. The faith must come in order for us to actually have the ability to seize the opportunity. If you talk about freedom, I can give you all kinds of opportunities, but if you don't have the power or ability to take advantage of them, then it, it's of no use. You're not free to do anything. Uh, so it takes both the opportunity. You can have all the ability in the world, by the way, but if you never have any opportunity, then you're still not free. Right? So freedom is more than just a right to do something. It's really an opportunity and an ability or power to do it. And Jesus Christ has solved all of those things for men by the gift of himself on the cross. And in Christ, we can truly be free. Now, in this, in this passage, most of your commentaries will say that, and it's very well true, that Christ was using a, a common Roman custom of the day to uh, talk about how that the son who had, uh, if the father had had servants in the home, and the child had been raised up with those servants. Uh, then when the father passed away, that if the son wanted to, he could set all those people at liberty because he had the authority vested in him as the owner and manager of the estate of the father. Perfectly accurate, perfectly adequate uh, representation of the son setting at free, setting at liberty those whom he would make free. He has all the authority. He has all the power. He's the judge. Even, even Paul says it's not only God that justifies, but it's also Christ that condemns. It's Christ who has the power to justify, and it's Christ who condemns. Which is good news for us who are sinners, because he's able to justify us, all those who come to him in faith. And so I, I want to stop there, even though it's an awkward and unusual place to stop this morning. Um, because most of that is a preface, and tonight we may share a little more particularly but don't ever be led away from the fact that in spite of all the other good material uh, that we may see or find or come across, the only place that you can get uh, pure truth is from God's word. Amen. And even as, even as those who have put their faith in Christ, how necessary is it to really seek unto this book? Uh, you know, the Christian life is not one of uh, per seeking permissiveness as far as what God will allow. It's one of seeking what pleases him. It's the same difference between graduating from uh, seeing your father as an authority who grants permission to do things to now having a relationship that's mature enough to know, I want to please dad. That's the same thing that Christ wants with us. Someone who's mature enough to have that relationship. And the, and the gospel teaches us how to please him. And that is true freedom, by the way. True freedom. Sin will always disappoint, it will always uh, deceive, it will always destroy, and it's not going to lead you anywhere but further and further into captivity. I'm speaking the truth from God's word, I'm speaking the truth from my own experience, I'm speaking it, everyone that's ever been down that road in scripture, it ends the same way. It is bondage and it is captivity, and we need the Lord Jesus Christ and his power to set us free from it. Amen. So with that said, I'm just going to leave it right there for this morning. And, uh, and, and maybe the Lord will use something that was spoken to encourage your heart this afternoon. Uh, this evening, for those who are able to be back, we'll take a look at another, for instance, in Scripture that really sets these things in motion for us.